Hello, I'm Michael Francis, Music Director of the Florida Orchestra, and this is our last WSMR performance this season at 7 o'clock this Thursday. We have a wonderful program that I wanted to really celebrate the welcoming of summer and the opportunity for us to really enjoy our vacation in optimistic form. For both of the pieces of music you're about to hear have a very exuberant yet pastoral feeling. Shai Wozner, our soloist, back in 2017 has provided us a short introduction to Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 4. And for me, this piece, which was premiered in 1808 at this famous concert, which I mentioned last time, which had the Sixth Symphony, the Fifth Symphony, the Choral Fantasy, Four Piano Concerto, Ar Pavido, the Aria, and a Mass, and all sorts of things. An incredible concert, just celebrating Beethoven. But this piece, for me, is my personal favorite of the piano concertos. We have the stern, more revolutionary power of the third. We have the heroic, exultant nature of the Emperor Concerto. But here in the fourth, we find ourselves in more pastoral beauty. And I am here in the grounds of Eton College in England and a typical summer's day where you do need to wear three layers with a beautiful view of a small pond or well, sort of a lake, but I would say a large pond as we like to call it here. Um, in the grounds of Eton College, which is a, a magnificent place and, of course, the great school. And this piece begins with these sort of rather genteel, searching, probing chords in the piano. And often in piano concertos you have quite a strong relationship, sort of almost like antagonists between the soloist trying to take power over the orchestra and the orchestra trying to silence the soloist. But here it feels very congenial. It feels much more like they're working together. And the first movement has this effortless lyricism to it. That we feel like the Greek chorus is in consort with the soloist. In the second movement though things change. And here you notice that the orchestra has a very powerful, almost military idea. And it is the piano who's trying to soothe the savage beast. People have likened it to Orpheus calming the Furies. And the orchestra then gradually it's softer in the somber E minor until the end we have this haunting incredible silence. As the last movement, the third movement begins, it feels as if we're trying to find our way out of that rather melancholic feeling we've achieved at the end of the second movement. But then the playfulness, the joy, the life, the optimism, the games, the hijinks take over and we end in beautiful uplifting and buoyant form, as if spring has sprung into summer. And now suddenly all life is not just born, but thriving in the most wonderful way. Hi everyone, and welcome to this broadcast from the Florida Orchestra. I'm pianist Chai Wozner. You know, Beethoven's fourth piano concerto is definitely one of my favorites. It's music that's vulnerable and triumphant and, and everything in between. And I definitely remember the week playing this piece with the Florida Orchestra and the musicians on stage and their enthusiasm and Michael's great, great energy on the podium. And above all, the audience, which is what we musicians miss more than anything nowadays, that we cannot have live concerts. So please enjoy this amazing concerto, one of the most profound ever written, Beethoven's Fourth. And thanks so much for joining us. Well, when we go to the next piece, Brahms Symphony Number no. 2, Brahms had the sun comes out. This is perfect for two reasons. First, it shows the joy and light that this piece was for Brahms. And secondly, you shall now watch me squint for the next few minutes as I talk about this piece. Brahms' Symphony No. 2 was written in 1877. His first symphony took 20 years of gestation in terms of him trying to overcome the spectre of Beethoven's influence upon him. This powerful piece of music wrestling with the deepest ideas. Well, the second symphony was written in the summer. It was written at Portschach, which is in the Wörthersee in the Styrian Alps in Austria. A beautiful countryside all around him. He wrote it in the summer in this tiny little room uh, where they had to struggle to get the piano up the stairs. And it just poured out of him. And it begins without any long, portentous introduction. Straight away, these bucolic horns just allow the music to unfold. It's in three which is slightly unusual for a first movement. Of course, the Eroica Symphony of Beethoven has it, but a lot of movements usually in two or four. It's a more formal strength to it for the first movement. But in this movement, 
we feel this nature around us just inspiring the music. Although it's not without its darkness, there are many passages of very stormy um, and dangerous music that comes out from it as well, but a lot of absolute beauty. In the second movement, there seems to be something more intimate, more gently melancholic, more introverted about the writing, this adagio sort of again searching in its own way. But in the third movement, which is a scherzo, which of course as we know in Italian means joke, here it's a joke but there's something of a serenade, and a serenade is music written for the night time. It's music written for um, a real party outside, it is outdoor music, and there's a joyfulness and a lightness and a, an esprit de corps about the writing. In the last movement we start to really sense the, the influence of Haydn, and the music for this is, um, is beautiful, it is uplifting, it is fiery, it is vivacious, it is virtuosic, and the whole piece is builds and that sort of Beethoven sense of long-term momentum until we get to this absolutely outrageously fast and exciting rush towards the summer. And this gives me a chance to say thank you very much for tuning into these concerts. This season has been very different to what we expected and what we'd hoped. We didn't have our chance to perform this wonderful music for you. We've done our very best by allowing you to hear these wonderful recordings. And when I should say the Beethoven was from a performance I conducted with Shai Wozner, a soloist, but the Brahms is from a performance with the great legendary conductor Gunther Herbeck. And just a quick aside to that is that Gunther Herbeck and I met each other at a very small tailor's in Taiwan, in Taipei. We both were getting ourselves fitted and it's not often that you see two conductors in one room. I mean it was a tiny room, maybe 10 foot by 10 foot, both trying to practice our little gestures self-consciously next to each other. You don't see two conductors in one room. I'm not sure what you call a group of conductors. There's a gaggle of geese, maybe a, a conceit of conductors or something. Anyway, so that was quite entertaining. The first time we met each other was there in this funny little tailor shop in Taipei. But a, a legendary conductor and a wonderful sense of that connection of the German history, right back from Brahms, then through Hans Richter, and he was taught by the great masters as well. So this is a, a, a very deep, powerful performance. But as I said, we look forward to seeing you now in the October uh, and, and into the fall for the start of our new season which will be, of course, slightly different with all the regulations around us, but will give us a chance to perform wonderful music for you. We miss you, I know you miss us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, um, well, once things settle down. But from sunny England, from Eton, it is my, I send my love to you, and I look forward to seeing you soon.